title that I chose was In Preparation for the Night of Power. Um, and to, to begin with, one of the principles that our scholars they elucidate concerning our religion is that often the benefit of an event it begins to arrive before the event actually occurs. And the example of this in nature, for example, is the rising of the sun. So if the sun rises at six o'clock, the light of the sun begins to spread across the horizon roughly an hour or so prior to that. Now this principle can be used and applied in general, but it, it works really well with the example of the uh, month of Ramadan. Now we see that the Prophet wasallam prior to the month uh, of Ramadan coming, the Prophet used to fast uh, extensively in the month of Sha'ban. Uh, so much so that according to some traditions, the Prophet would fast the entire month of Sha'ban. Um, also, once we enter the month of Ramadan, you know, although the combination of the blessings of this month is in the night of power, we continue to experience these blessings throughout the entire month. And this presents a tremendous opportunity for us, in particularly for people like us, who Shaitan has a field day for 11 months. You know, he makes us uh, think of things that we never imagined we could think of. He makes us say things that we never imagined we could ever say. And so this opportunity to rectify ourselves is a huge opportunity that we should uh, uh, definitely uh, take advantage of. Now, one of the beautiful characteristics of our Islamic tradition is that every ritualistic aspect of our faith, and it's not simply performative in nature, but it's tied to certain ethical outcomes and morals and values. If you take the example of the five daily prayers, um, if, if I'm a person who prays five times a day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has defined certain ethical outcomes to be associated with my five daily prayers. Allah, Allah says, in الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَةِ that indeed prayer wards off indecency and lewdness. Now, if I continue to pray five times a day and yet I'm an indecent and lewd person, then there's something wrong or there's something lacking in my prayer. Now, the Prophet wasallam, with regards to fasting made it very clear when he said وسلم, in a hadith that مَن لَمْ يَضَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمِلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةً فِي أَنْ يَضَعَ طَعَامُهُ وَشَرَابُهُ that whosoever does not give up uttering falsehood or acting according to it, then Allah is in no need for that person to give up his food and drink. So what we need to be mindful of is that we're not just here um, abstaining for food and drink, but we're also refraining or restraining ourselves from anything that could have, that could potentially have a negative impact on our character and our behavior. And here each one of us, should contemplate and think that what is there in my character that needs that is that is inappropriate, if you will, and that requires change on my part. Now, if we look at the two forces that hold us back from doing good, you know, one of it is external, uh, and that is the whispers of the shaitan, and the other is internal, which is our nafs. And as Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that the shaitan is chained during the month of Ramadan, which leaves us with the nafs. Now, we've seen through scientific experiments that we may have done um, earlier in our careers or our, during our education, that when you're conducting an experiment with multiple variables, and if you would like to study the impact of each of the variables separately, what you do is you remove those variables one, one after the other. So you can understand the impact of, that each of the variable has. On, on, on the experiment. And likewise, if we remove shaitan, by removing shaitan from the, from the equation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents us with this opportunity to, to evaluate the true nature of our nafs. So we could see that where is it that I fall short? And is it that I lie to others? Is it that I backbite others? Is, is my love for wealth uh, preventing me from spending freely in charity? And, and this is where the, the process of self-reflection and, and introspection uh, comes into play. And one of the things that we learn in the process of self-reflection uh, self is to be able to read the signs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes us go through certain experiences in our life 
to that, that, that help us remind of our current state, of our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's only those people who truly understand uh, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessed and or who are sincere in their process of introspection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows them to truly discern these signs. Uh, now, what exactly do I mean by that? So there is an, uh, an incident in the life of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Imam Abu Hanifa, as we all know, is one of the four main scholars of the uh, of, 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 of fiqh. Uh, and it's related that once he was traveling for to perform pilgrimage, and while performing one of the rituals of pilgrimage, Imam Abu Hanifa accidentally stepped on the foot of a young person, and that person responded back angrily. He said, "Do you not have fear of Allah?" And to that, uh, when Abu Hanifa heard that, he fainted and he passed out. Now, when he regained consciousness, I mean, the people surrounding him said that. Uh, it was just a young person who said things out of emotion, so you did not really have to take what he said very seriously. But what Imam Abu Hanifa said in response was very profound. And he said that, I fear that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who put those words in his mouth. I fear that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who put those words in his mouth. In other words, Imam Abu Hanifa read this as a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his response did not reflect an inflated ego, but it reflected a soul that was constantly seeking uh, close proximity and, and a stronger connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another example I want to share in this regard is that it's related that once Imam Malik rahimahullah, who in his time was considered to be the Imam of Medina, he, he, once he entered the Masjid al Nabawi between the time of Asr and Maghrib. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has advised us that no one should enter the masjid except that they should first pray two rak'ahs of tahiyyat al-masjid uh, or the salutation to the masjid. But Imam Malik was of the, but there's another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu in which the Prophet said that between the time the Prophet prohibited uh, pr- uh, praying supererogatory prayers or the nawafil prayers between the time of Asr and Maghrib. And so Imam Malik would give preference to the second hadith over the first one. And so when he would en- he would when he would enter the masjid between t- the time of Asr and Maghrib, he would not pray the, the two rakats of Tahiyyat al-Masjid. So anyway, so as, as Imam Malik entered, he came and he sat down, and there was a younger person sitting next to him, and uh, th- that young person said, "Get up and pray two rakats of Tahiyyat al-Masjid." And so Imam Malik stood up and he started praying. Now his his students who were around there they were very surprised, uh, and so as soon as Imam Malik was done. Uh, they came to him and they asked him, they inquired him about this. And so Imam Malik said that my opinion has not changed, nor have I gone back to what I taught you. I merely feared that if I had not prayed the two rakat as this boy had commanded, then Allah would have included me amongst those about whom he has said, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُ مُرْكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُوا That when they are asked to bow down in prayer, they do not bow. So again, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, Two read this as a sign, as a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, his response was one that allowed him to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and, and, and it's very likely that many of us, we probably would have responded in a different manner, one that would have been reflective of our own inflated egos. But Imam Malik, did, uh, rahimahullah, did not do that. Now, how are these examples related to us? And I would like to share another example uh, and tie it with the night of power, inshallah. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or, or before that. We know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has advised us to seek the night of power in the odd night of the last 10 nights of the month of Ramadan, right, to the 21st through the 29th. There's another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said concerning Laylatul Qadr that whosoever is deprived of it, referring to Laylatul Qadr, Whosoever is deprived of it is deprived of all good. And none is deprived of it except an unfortunate person. None is deprived of it except an unfortunate person. Now imagine a person who makes the intention to get up earlier in the morning, a few moments prior to his or her regular time of suhoor. So that time could then be spent uh, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, during the odd night. So the person sets up his alarm and so forth and goes to sleep uh, on the first night, on the 21st night and yet sleeps through the night. 
um, is, is not able to get up. Then this person tries again on the 23rd, uh, tries to take the necessary measures to get up, but sleeps through the night again. And then the same thing happens on the 25th and the 27th and the 29th. Uh, and, and so he does not, he misses out on all the opportunity. Now there are two ways to look at this. You may have a person who may say that, well, I tried, I tried, and so perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward me for my intention. But there's another way of looking at it, that maybe there's something wrong in my, in my practice or in my behavior or in my character that is so displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah probably prevented me from the honor of worshiping in the night of power. Now, this may be a very frightening thought. This may be a very frightening thought, my dear brothers and sisters, but it is, it is only through an honest assessment of our inner condition with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will be able to rid ourselves from the diseases of the heart and we will be able to take up a course of action that will bring us closer and, and, and draw us as nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what introspection is all about. And that is what self-reflection is all about. Brothers and sisters, Ramadan, as we know, is considered to be a time for change. A time for change. But we know that if you've taken a course in change management, one of the first things that they teach you is that a change, which is not sustainable, has little to no benefit to it. So if I lose 10 pounds, for example, you know, by actively working out in the gym or by depriving myself of all the wonderful food that I could otherwise enjoy. And yet soon after I lose uh, those 10 pounds, I regain that weight back. See, the amount of benefit that I could have accrued as a result of losing those 10 pounds, I have basically lost it. Now, similarly, if we enter the month of Ramadan with the burden of our sins, and we spent countless hours uh, in the recitation of Quran, we spent the, the day fasting, we spend the night standing up in Qiyam and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet, as soon as we're done with the month of Ramadan, we go back to our old norms, then while we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through His mercy, will still accept our good deeds, at the very least what we can say is that we missed out on the true potential of, of the month of Ramadan. Uh, and so I would like to share just a few things uh, as a reminder, first and foremost, to myself. Uh, and then you, my dear brothers and sisters, that could poten potentially help us not only to maximize the benefit that we have, that we can get from the last few days of the month of Ramadan, but also to, uh, to help us maintain the momentum that we build, the momentum of doing good deeds, uh, and to maintain that after the month of Ramadan as well. Now, the first thing I want to talk about, and this is in no specific order of importance. I've just meant sharing a few things that I've heard from my teachers and, and, and scholars. Uh, it's not necessarily in, in a specific order. The first one I want to point out is to reflect on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes and his name, they manifest in our lives. You know, it's said that we cannot love someone unless we know them. And the only way we, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is by learning through about his names and his attributes and by reflecting on how those attributes, they continue to manifest in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, I'd like to share an example. It's a rather crude example, but I think it, it drives home the point. Um, imagine you have, you, sometimes you have in those in, in fairs and festivals where we go to, you have a shop or a line of shops that are selling basically same items. So imagine you have a store that's selling dust clusters, you know, that cleaning item that you use to clean blinds and so forth. Um, and so a customer walks in and asks the shopkeeper for a dustbuster. So, so the shopkeeper pulls one out, hands it over to the customer. But the customer said, no, no, I don't want this one. And I want the one there at the top. And so the shopkeeper looks up. He said, well, it's the same brand, same color, and same dustbuster. So here it is. You can have this one. The customer continues to insist, and the shopkeeper, after getting considerably annoyed, he says, you know what, take it or leave it. And no sooner has he said that, the customer reaches out to his wallet, pulls out a card, gives it, hands it over to the shopkeeper who reads it. It says, Inspector Consumer Protection Agency. And so the shopkeeper immediately complies, you know, climbs up the ladder, 
pulls out the dust buster, wipes it clean, hands it over to the shopkeeper. Now, what exactly changed? You have the same shopkeeper, you have the same customer, and you have the same dust buster. But the only thing that changed was the information, the amount of information that the shopkeeper had about the customer. And we say that that for Allah are the highest of analogies. But just to help us understand that in the same manner that when we come to realize our dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my dear brothers and sisters, that is when we truly understand that, that how much we are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is, in one of the hikam of Ibn Abdullah Sikandari, it, it said that, as he, as he said, Ilahi ana al faqiru fil ghinaya. That, oh my Lord, I'm indeed in need of you in my state of, in my state of affluence. But كَيْفَ لَا أَكُونُ فَقِيرًا فِي فَقْرِي That how is it that I, w- I would not be in need of you in my state of poverty? So, so realizing that even though we are under this illusion that we are the ones who are managing and controlling our affairs, ultimately it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is in control. And by learning and, and, uh, and reflecting on the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and trying to see how those attributes are constantly manifesting in our day-to-day lives, we can appreciate that better and we can work on strengthening um, our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in a more profound manner as well. The second thing I want to mention is dua. And dua it, it ties in with the first because dua essentially is a manifestation of our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the stronger our connection, the more frequently we would feel the need to reach, reach out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the weaker our connection, the less inclined we would be to, to reach out and, and to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what's amazing about dua is that the response of every dua, it has been guaranteed by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As it's related in the hadith, or a part of the hadith where the Messenger of Allah said that إلا أتاه الله إياها أو صرف عنه من سوء مثلها that either Allah would respond to dua in its original form you know, as we had requested it or through that dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ward off would subvert any kind of harm that was written in our faith. Now when the companions heard this one of them responded back and he, he said that إذا نكثر that if there's a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there will be a definitive response to every dua that we make, then we, we're going to increase ourselves in making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he responded, he said, Allahu Asr, that no matter how frequently you call up upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you would find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more plentiful, that Allah is more plentiful in responding to your du'as. Now, the third thing I want to mention in this regard is um, our connection with the Qur'an. You know, we, we see that the month of Ramadan is a month that finds its significance in the fact that it, it, this is the month where the, when, the, when the, the Qur'an was revealed. Um, now, what's interesting about our connection with the Qur'an is that when we... That it starts to open up meaning. When we strive to build our connection with the Qur'an, it starts to gradually open up, uh, open up uh, certain meanings that then give us conviction in our faith. And this is particularly important in the time that we live in because the popular discourse is constantly trying to introduce doubts or cast doubts about uh, our faith in our mind. And I would like to share an example from the life of Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah. That, but, but before that, we know that in our um, in, in in our Islamic law, there are four prime. There are considered we have four primary sources of Islamic law. We have the Quran, we have the Sunnah of the Prophet, we have Ijma, and then we have Qiyas. Now, Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, who is considered to be the first to to codify the Islamic legal theory, he used to talk about Ijma uh, in his duhus. And in one of his halaqat, there was a person named Al Muzani who came to his halaqa and he said that show me the proof of ijma' from the Qur'an. And if you cannot provide that, then, then, be, then be quiet and stop talking about ijma'. And so Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah did not have a response right away. He asked for uh, respite for three days. And he isolated himself. And during that time, he 
continued to uh, read Quran during his qiyam. And after three days, he came out and he, he read the verse, uh, now, I'm not going to read the translation because it's not the meaning of the verse, but it's really the process of learning from the Qur'an that is what I'm trying to draw your attention here. That how many times do you think Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah had read the entire Qur'an? You know, probably more times than any one of us right here. But it took him all of those recitations of the Qur'an and several more that he spent during standing up in Qiyam before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up the meaning and opened up the verse for him that is to date used as a proof of ijma' from the Qur'an. Now similarly, if we are able to, it's one thing to simply passively read through Qur'an, but if we are able, if we are able to spend a few moments to reflect on it, and actively strive on developing and understanding the Qur'an gradually open, opens up meaning which will then significantly and exponentially um, increase our conviction and our faith, which will make it, which will subsequently make it much easier for us to, uh, to follow the injunctions and the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the last point I want to mention, I'll, and I'll conclude with this, is uh, to spend in charity. And we know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as it's related about him, is that كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس وأجود ما يكون في شهر رمضان that the messenger of, messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most generous of people. And the time that he was exceedingly generous is the time in the month of Ramadan. And, and so, especially during these circumstances that we're currently living in where a lot of people have great degree of uncertainty about where their economic sustenance is going to come from, um, you know, being subjected to these lockdowns and so forth, um, it, it becomes increasingly important that we, we, we spend, because when you imagine people who are struggling, or if you imagine, if you imagine a father who's struggling to provide a single meal a day, uh, to his family, or a mother who struggles um, by looking and, and struggles through the pain of watching her children uh, go through the night um, and, and cry through the night out of hunger. Um, this, this should be a reminder because in our circumstances, many of us, alhamdulillah, we are blessed with uh, a lot more than what we need. And this is the time, a lot of times when we give out in charity, we tend to give out in a manner that does not really affect us in any way. It's just money coming out of our checking account or of our credit or from our credit card and simply going into the, the account of some of the char, uh, charitable organizations. But as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded us that the best charity is the one where you feel a pinch, where you feel a pinch. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also reminded us that Sadaqa, it does not, it does not take away from your wealth. It actually results, the barakah that comes about as a result of spending freely in the, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the service of His creation, it brings a barakah that, that adds to your wealth, if you will. And it's related that once Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, according to her, she, as she relates that, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once slaughtered a goat and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stepped out and when he came back, he asked, how much of its meat is remaining? And so Aisha radiallahu anha uh, responded saying that nothing remains except the shoulder piece. That nothing of the goat has remained except the shoulder piece. Uh, essentially meaning that we gave everything out in charity. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded back saying that everything remains except the shoulder piece. That whatever you're consuming, that is the only thing that's not going to remain. Otherwise, everything else is what you're going to find waiting for you in the hereafter. Uh, in conclusion, my dear brothers and sisters, as we continue to spend the, the last days of Ramadan fasting and, and standing up in Qiyam and, and continuing our recitation of the Qur'an, uh, we should remember that Ramadan is essentially a month of training that prepares us to meet the challenges uh, outside of this month. And, and so we should not lose sight of this, this fact. Uh, and inshallah, as we continue to, to pray, uh, and, and continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to give us all the opportunity
to, to worship in the night of power. Um, and, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who are forgiven and made pure, uh, about whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that, We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our supplications, uh, our du'as. We ask Allah to remove and purify our hearts from any kind of diseases that may prevent from our du'as uh, from being accepted. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته